Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew 28. And I know you can read it from your memory. It's a, it's a scripture that uh, all of us know, I assume. But it is the scripture that God is giving us this morning and speaking to us through it. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. The Bible says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we are so privileged to be here, to be gathered in your presence, to call you our Father, our God, our provider, the restorer of our lives. And this morning, Jehovah God, we want to once again commit ourselves into your hand. Even, Father, as you share the bread of life with us, we pray that everyone shall be satisfied, everyone shall be attended to. I pray that this word will minister to everyone that is here and them that are following us virtually. Lord, I pray that your name shall be glorified and I pray that this word will bring a transformation in our lives to the glory and honor of your name. I submit myself to the authority of the blessed Holy Spirit and I ask that you may use me as a vessel and at the end of it all, may the Lord receive the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may take your seats. This month is our missions month, missions and RCPS month. And our focus this month has been on missions. Uh, you know, going out for missions, actually carrying out the mission of God. God has got only one mission, and that is to redeem humanity. But we have so many things within the mission of God, and that's why we call them missions. We go, we evangelize, we disciple, we baptize, we, we do all sorts of things, even schools and reaching out, even treatment like we've had. All those are missions which serve within the mission of God. And this, this day, we've been hearing a lot, a lot about synergy, about RCPS, about planting of churches, and of course our theme scripture remains uh, synergy for growth in this year, Judges 1 verse 3, and, and so we still continue with synergy, we've not even, we've just scratched the surface, we've not even uh, gotten into the depth of synergy, and actually we saw that synergy yesterday when everyone came and we were able to do the mission of God in this place. And so today we are going to look at the components of the Great Commission. I know so much has been said about the Great Commission, a lot of preaching has been done on the Great Commission, but we still have a lot to learn this morning. So we will look at what is it that entails the Great Commission even as we serve in this month, Missions and RCPS Month. So um, just as a way of introduction, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the Bible is full of wisdom and information concerning the plan of God to save humanity. From Genesis, God created everything that you see. You know, the heavens, the earth, the animals, the plants, the living beings, the beasts, and, and even people. He created things for his own glory. And actually, he created man in his own image and likeness. And, you know, God's agenda 
was so that he can have fellowship with man. That is how it was in the beginning. And we can see clearly and openly, God is talking about relationship. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, God created this man and placed him in the Garden of Eden. And every evening, he would visit and have fellowship with man. And that is how it was intended. Until in chapter number 3, when sin came into the world, and then there was a separation between man and God for some while. But you can see that this is not how God intended for it from the beginning. So there was that separation due to sin. And man was working very hard, you know, to, to, to cover his nakedness. When I was studying the book of Genesis, I was wondering, what was man looking for? You know, as much as the devil came and introduced knowledge and said, you know, God is telling you not to, to eat from the tree so that you don't get the knowledge. So I was asking myself, after getting the knowledge, what happened? What benefit did it give man? And at this point, I want to say that whatever God has given you is sufficient for you. You don't have to look for anything and fight for anything. And, you know, go, you know, out of the way to get what he has not given you. And actually, that spirit of being dissatisfied with what God has given us is the one that has caused us a lot of problems. Sometimes we pay so much because of seeking to get that which in God's wisdom you know, it's so clear that you don't need that thing. God knew that at that time, they never needed that. But the devil, you know, cunningly comes, creeps in, and, act, and, and says to the woman, did God actually say? You see that kind of deception. And that is where we have been, most of us. Sometimes you look at Adam and Eve, and you ask yourself, what was wrong with them? And I would ask, what is wrong with us? Because the same things God has been speaking over time. God has been telling us this is okay for you. But we still fight to get that which he has not given us. And so we fall so much into the same sin that Adam fell in. And you know, when you look at uh, God, that day when he came, after they ate from the tree, he came looking for fellowship. And man was hiding. You know, he tried to get leaves to cover his nakedness, but nothing was covered. The more he covered himself, the more he found himself naked. There is no solution for our sin apart from in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So man's struggle was cut short when God came. And he slaughtered an animal and covered the nakedness of man. You know, signifying that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. An animal had to die for the man to be covered. And that was satisfactory at that particular time. But that was not sufficient forever. God was showing us or introducing us to the sacrifice of his son that was going to come later in the fullness of time so that humanity can be saved. And I want to tell us, church, that we have no other business, we have no other agenda than promoting the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Our business here on earth is pegged around the Great Commission. And I want to sensitize the church and I want to encourage the church and tell you that throughout scripture, the Great Commission is not found only in Matthew 28. The Great Commission is found from Genesis to Revelation because it unfolds and unveils the plan of God for humanity. And so we see even after that, God pronouncing the first gospel you know, the first gospel that was pronounced in scripture is in Genesis 3.15. Maybe we can turn there, Genesis 3.15, and see what God said. I'm just 
building up so that I can take you to the Great Commission. Because many of the times we think that if you don't talk about Matthew 28, uh, 16 to 20, you're not talking about the Great Commission. So the first pronouncement of the gospel is in Genesis 3.15, and it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Talking about Jesus. Then it says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is the first pronouncement of the gospel of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ that brings salvation. And, you know, after that, we go to Exodus. God again is showing us how he, he, his plan is to rescue man from slavery, from sin, and to bring that person to the place of abundance. The people of Israel had gone to Egypt, you know, for, uh, for food. They were looking for food, and they settled and multiplied in, in Egypt. And God is showing us how he delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh and, you know, began the journey to the promised land. You can see from Numbers, Still the great commission. God is numbering the people. He's taking them from the wilderness. He's taking them, you know, step by step. When you come from that, you go to, you know, all the, all the, the Bible, all the books of the Bible, they are talking about the great commission. And so when we are still, when we are still at Genesis, we see God calling Abraham in chapter number 12 of Genesis and he gives him a promise. And church, this is quite interesting. In Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the first covenant God is cutting with man, and particularly with Abraham. When you go to chapter number 13, verse 14 of Genesis, the Bible says, The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from, from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westwards. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if, if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the ox of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar for the Lord. God again is talking about how he's going to multiply the seed of Abram. And this seed of Abram will be like the dust of the earth. I'm building up, and then I will bring you to our place. Turn to Genesis uh, chapter 22, verse 17. The Bible says, I will bless you, and I will surely multiply you, uh, your offspring, as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Praise the Lord. And you know, when you think about this scripture, you begin to, you know, look at the people that are on the face of the earth, and you feel that it is a, a fulfillment of the promise of God. But when you come to Romans uh, chapter number four, please, today there is a lot of reference in the scripture because I'm dealing with a with a topical sermon, and with a topical sermon, we have to look through scriptures to really get understanding. Romans chapter 4 and verse number 13. 
For the promise to Abraham, Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Praise the name of the Lord. And again in Galatians, you will see the Bible or Paul talking about that seed of Abraham, that blessing of increase like the sand of the seashore and the stars of the skies to be the people that God was going to call into the kingdom. Praise the name of the Lord. And therefore, we have a lot of work as the church of Jesus Christ. We have to commit ourselves to the Great Commission so that we can see people multiplying in salvation as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore. If that is going to be the case, then all of us must participate in the mission of God. Praise the name of the Lord. And so uh, from the text that I read, we are going to uh, extract four components of, uh, of the Great Commission. And we can see the emphasis is all, you know, A double L, all. So the first component of the Great Commission is all authority. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to tell us, church, that without the authority of Jesus Christ, there is no man that can claim salvation. Without the power of Jesus Christ, there is no person that can claim salvation. And so Jesus had already spoken to the disciples and told them, you know, we are going to meet, we are going to gather again upon the mountain in Galilee after my resurrection. And so Jesus resurrected and proceeded to the place of meeting in Galilee. And when he came, the 11 disciples were already there. They had come to have the meeting with Jesus. And Jesus produced himself. You know, you would ask yourself, this Jesus who is talking about authority, this is the man that has been beaten, you know, crucified. This man has been flogged. This man has worn a hat of thorns. This man has been bleeding. And you know, as I looked at about authority when I was doing my study, I was trying to imagine what is Jesus bringing to the disciples? You know, I can imagine when you're walking with a powerful man or woman, whatever the case may be, and then you have put your trust in that person. You know, that feeling of you cannot touch me because I'm working with a very important person. I believe that was the feeling of the disciples. You know, as they walked with Jesus, he's bringing the healing to the people. He's doing miracles. He's commanding the seas. He's commanding the waters. He's doing all sorts of miracles. The, the disciples must have had a lot of confidence in him. And then I was imagining when, when the authorities began to flog Jesus and to beat him, when Jesus is falling down, you know, and unable to carry the cross, what was going on in the minds of the disciples? They must have felt defeated, don't you think so? They must have felt worn out. They must have felt exposed. And probably they were thinking, the people that we've been showing this authority, what are they going to do to us? Now that our power has been, uh, has been taken away from us. And I'm imagining it was worse when Jesus was put in that grave. You know, they put him in the grave. They sealed the grave. They even put a stone there to cover him. They even put soldiers to guard the tomb. So everything about Jesus, I know Easter is coming. But Easter for us as believers is every day. Praise the name of the Lord. And the message of Easter is relevant even in January. Praise the name of the Lord. Because that is where we draw power. That is where we draw, uh, you know, our being from. And so they put the seal there. They put the soldiers there. And they are under command. Guard this man. Lest he rises up 
and goes here cheating people, lying to people that he's the resurrected Messiah. And so I'm imagining what was going on in the hearts and minds of the disciples. But wait a minute. The stone could not hold Jesus in the grave. Let me tell you the authority of Jesus that we are talking about is an authority that can put all those soldiers down. How he came out of the grave, the soldiers didn't know. They could not guard the grave because they are guarding an authority that commands the, the, the sea to obey. An authority that brought everything into existence. Did you know that Jesus was involved in creation? Jesus was involved in creation and we see his authority in creation. He put everything in place. And this Jesus that they are talking about here is the one that was prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, probably we may turn there. I warned you that we will read a lot of scriptures. Please bear with me. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1, the Bible says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the, in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea. They are talking about Jesus. It's a prophecy about this king of glory. The land beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of, of, of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy are the heavens. I want to skip and go to, to verse number six. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder authority. Praise the name of the Lord. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, uh, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. That is the authority of Jesus it has been prophesied. You read Isaiah 7, you will see the, 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 the Jesus being prophesied about. And this is now the Jesus that has been given to the Jews, but they have rejected him. This is the authority that Jesus now appears and says, you know, all authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. So the first component of the Great Commission is all authority. Not just authority, but all authority. Jesus has got authority over everything in this earth. So even as we carry out the Great Commission, we are not carrying out the Great Commission with our strength. We are not doing it with our power. We are doing it because of the authority of Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to Jesus. And they had seen the authority of Jesus through the miracles. You know, Jesus went into a wedding, had been invited in a wedding, and the wine ran out, and Jesus came. He said, fill, get containers, fill them with water. And he came and turned the water into wine. The best wine that the guests had ever taken. That is the authority of Jesus. I see him meeting a man with a withered hand. And just the encounter with Jesus, the hand grows, grows again. I see him visiting the tomb of Lazarus and calls out, Lazarus come out and Lazarus comes out. What other authority are we looking for? And if Jesus can resurrect the dead, then we have that authority to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Praise the name of the Lord. We are not going in our power. Those who have been so scared about going out for missions, 
You need to sign up because you're not going in your own authority, power, and making. We are marching forth in the authority of Jesus Christ. So he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I look at Jesus when the disciples were drowning and he was sleeping on a pillow. By the way, be careful what Jesus is doing in your life. Hallelujah. Some of us believers, we end it at salvation. For as long as you welcomed him in your life, that is it. You have killed it. But I want to tell you, it's more important to check what is Jesus doing in my life. He could be your savior, but he is sleeping in your boat of life. And so they, they, they had him in their boat. They are crossing over, they are sinking. And then they come with a complaint. They tap him, don't you care that we are perishing? Who said he doesn't care? You welcomed him and you allowed him to sleep. And so Jesus rises up and calms the storm. He has authority over nature. So wherever you go for missions and there's nature that is threatening, you are carrying an authority that submits. I mean, you're, you're carrying a Jesus whom the nature can submit to. You find Forces of darkness and demons, because I know most of us fear to go for missions because you hear testimonies of how the demons were laughing at people. But I want to tell you, we are carrying an authority of a person that drove away demons from people, Amen. even so many of them. There is no demon that Jesus spared. That is the authority that we carry to the mission field. Hallelujah. And so the power of the gospel is pegged on the authority of Jesus Christ. As you march forth, you're going out in the authority of Jesus Christ. So he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then we go to the second component of the Great Commission, and the second component is all nations. The, actually, you can just call them the alls of the Great Commission. All A double L, the alls of the Great Commission. So we have all authority. Now we are talking about all nations. You know, the kingdom of God has been extended to all mankind. There is no one who cannot access the power of salvation, the grace of salvation. And this kingdom is not for Nairobians. This kingdom is not for Kenyans. This kingdom is for the entire world. Even the worlds that we have no idea about. God has got them in his hands. And he's looking for somebody who will leave their comfort and go out there and make disciples. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, in Matthew, when you go back to Matthew 15, you will see Jesus restricting the, uh, the message of salvation to only Jews. He sent the men out and he said, go only to the household of the Jews. But you know, it is not a change of mind because when you look at the promise that he gave to Abraham, he said all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through you. But Jesus here gives an opportunity to the Jews who rejected them, who rejected him. And so Jesus now opens up this salvation and, you know, calls even somebody like, uh, like Paul and says, Paul, you're going to go to the Gentiles and you're going to bring salvation. You're going to take the message of salvation to the Gentiles. So Jesus had all of us included, all nations. Praise the name of the Lord. The kingdom of God, the great commission is for all nations. 
It is not for a certain tribe. It's not for a certain group of people. It is for every ethnic group. Hallelujah. I don't know how many have you visited with the gospel. How many people? We still have in Kenya. The last time I checked, we had 21 unreached people groups in Kenya. 21 unreached people group. And I, uh, because that was just before COVID, I don't think after COVID anything much has been done because COVID slowed our missional, you know, responsibility a great deal. And so we still have people who have never heard about Christ. And no wonder the emphasis from our bishop is, will you sit here when your brothers are going out for war? Will you sit here and be comfortable when somebody has never heard about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why would we as GCI Central hear the gospel of the kingdom a hundred times when there's somebody who has never heard it once? Why would we hear the gospel all, you know, all these times? Every Sunday we are gathered here, we hear the gospel. Every weekday we hear the gospel while there's somebody who has never heard it once. So we must wear our boots and get out to every ethnic group and minister the grace that brings salvation to them. Praise the name of the Lord. Like I said, the gospel is for everyone. And I want to bring an understanding in the, in the verse number 18 and 19, sorry. I know that your Bible says go. Um, maybe we can have the King James Version. I usually use ESV because King James is King James for me. But let's just see what he said. And Jesus came and spake. Unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, King James, <laughs> teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And even ESV translates it the same. Go therefore. But when you look at the Greek text, and that's why I encourage uh, all of us, just get into a little Greek. It's available even on Google. It's, you just click a button and you see. But when you look at the right and the perfect translation of verse number 19, it is a participle. Don't worry about the English. A, you know, something that you, have, you are already in the business of doing. So the translation from Greek into English says, having gone. Hallelujah. Amen. Having gone. Make disciples of all nations. Jesus is not expecting you to be seated. He is expecting you to have gone into the ethne, into the world. And so as you go, having gone to the, to the world, to the entire world, to the cosmos, then make disciples of all nations. And we miss a lot when we read, you know, the Bible in a translation because we don't get the right message. One of the rabbis, the, the, the Jewish teachers, said that reading the Bible in a translation is like kissing the bride through the veil. You have an idea? <laughs> it's like, you know, we usually do weddings here and after we finish, we tell the groom, you may now kiss the bride. And so you can imagine yourself kissing the bride through the veil. You've not removed the veil. So when you read the Bible in a translation, it's like doing that. And so you don't get the exact thing. <laughs> I am encouraging you <laughs> to put some more effort into Greek and Hebrew, even if it is the introduction. 
It will give you favor. And that's why you see many, many people saying that the Bible has contradiction. Because King James says this, ESV says this, the Living Translation says this, NIV says this. It's because the, 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 the people who are doing the translation, they were looking for the word that can bring the message forward. And so they get whatever nearest word there was. So having gone into all the world, make disciples of all nations. So Jesus' expectation is that we have already gone. You cannot be born again to sit in church. You can't. It is a disservice in the kingdom. We have to go. And going out for missions doesn't necessarily mean you go to Trukana and, and Tana River and the marginalized community. Even where you work, do not spare anything. Having gone to work, make disciples of all nations. Having gone to the market, make disciples of all nations. Praise the name of the Lord. Having gone to, back to your family, Make disciples of all nations. When I was doing my study on this text, I discovered that in this that we call the command, actually it is not the command. I, I don't want to confuse you, but I want, you to make, I want to make you understand. Having gone is a participle. Baptizing is a participle. Teaching is a participle. But making disciples is a command. Did you hear me? Having gone, teaching them, baptizing them. But when it comes to making disciples, it is a command. And I tell you, church of Jesus Christ, if we are not making disciples, we are not serving the great commission. Announcing the gospel alone does not win souls. Are we together? But grounding that soul in the word of God, making a disciple in that soul is now soul winning. If we are going out for missions and we do not have a plan for discipleship, it is a wasted resource. And Jesus gave a very good example and he said that a sower went to plant seed. And some fell on the rock, others on the highway, others fell uh, on the thorns, others on fertile ground. Even as we go for soul winning, as we evangelize, some seeds will fall on the highway. What have you done? Those seeds will be found there by birds and they will be swallowed. Others will, be, will fall on the thorns and they will be choked around and die. But the seed that falls on the fertile ground is the seed that grows and germinates. Soul winning is about making disciples. Amen. Grounding people in the word of God. And that's why we are planting churches. Because you have to gather people in a center like this one and ground them on the word of God. Amen. That is where the command is. Praise the name of the Lord. And we had a challenge during our revival last weekend. And we were told that we've been thinking about uh, 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 planting churches in 47 counties of this nation by the year 2030. And the preacher said that we must plant churches in 47 countries. You know, we were recharged. The vision has improved. And I tell you, even 47 countries is way below the Great Commission. We must go to the whole world and make disciples. We are just going in faces. 47 counties, 47 countries, and of course, six continents. Are they six or seven? Seven. We have to go to every place. Having gone to China, make disciples of all nations. Having gone to America, you're not thinking about yourself and how you're going to make money. Make disciples. Praise the name of the Lord. 
And there are places like Europe, you know, there are no, there are no people. There are no people. People are not even giving birth. The, the, you know, the natural giving birth. They are not. There are no people. And because Kenya, your GCI, and every person in Africa, we know how to do that. We can go. And having gone there, we make disciples. That is what Jesus is talking about. And the component number three, he says, all he has commanded. All he has commanded. Have your disciples gotten to know the commands of God? All of them. Even leave alone your disciples. Do you know the commands of God? Having gone, teach them all that I have commanded you. All that I have commanded you. And you cannot teach that which you don't know. We have to get time, you know, and sit back and learn the commands of God. I tell you, and I'm not saying this because I have gone to Bible school, but I have heard of people within the Christian fraternity saying that the disciples never went to Bible school. And I think you need to check your Bible properly. You need to check it again. I think Jesus took the disciples with himself. He called some fishermen. He called some people doing other things there. He called cowards and brought them to himself. And he taught them for three and a half years. Degree course. Thank you, Reverend Allah. They did a degree. And they went out for their practical ministry. They were told to go and do all these things. You know, show the, the authority, exercise the power that they have been seeing Jesus exercising. And I see Paul, when he was called by Jesus, he spent three years learning in Arabia, learning. And then he became the best of the apostles. So when I hear somebody saying that you don't have to go to Bible school, I get worried. How will you know? And, I'm, and even if you go, it is okay. Sign up for some course. Amen. Study the faith that you believe in. Study the word of God that you believe in so that you can give it without shame. Study to show yourself approved of God. Paul was telling Timothy 2.15, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's why we get beaten by the other religion. Because they start grounding their children from childhood. And I tell you, winning them is a problem. They are so grounded. They go for their training every time. And by the time you win that man or woman, or you have worked hard, we have to learn the word of God and teach everything that God has commanded us. And just finally, because of time, the other all is always with us. God is always with us. As we go, having gone, then... Jesus is with us. The authority is there. And we are going to the nation. We are teaching everything that he has commanded us. But there is a promise that Jesus is with us. I want you to imagine with me going to a, an unfamiliar place alone. You know, how does it feel? And then going to the same place with somebody who knows his way around. How does it feel? Jesus knows everywhere in this world. Jesus has gone to every place in this world. Jesus has encountered the storms in the past. He has, you know, uh, he has experienced the demoniacs in the past. He has faced the grave. He knows the world. He's gone to the sea. He's gone to the ocean. And he has seen the power of nature. But he has overcome it. That is the same Jesus who is saying, I am with you. Having gone, having gone, 
into the whole world, I am with you always. Fear not. Authority is there. Command is there. And the presence is there. Do not fear anything. Let us go and make disciples of all nations. Let us build centers where we can ground the people of God for a teaching, for growth, for maturity. Otherwise, you can, you, you can make disciples by evangelizing. They come to Jesus Christ. But the birds of this earth will come and eat them up. You will have done zero work. In conclusion, if the mission, if the mission of God is like, the children of Abraham being like the sand of the sea and the stars of the skies. If it is like that, then all of us must participate. If that, for, that uh, uh, command is going to be fulfilled, if that promise is going to be fulfilled, then we must multiply ourselves. Hallelujah. We must multiply our resources in church planting, we must be going, all of us, minus nobody, so that we see the kingdom of God, you know, filled with men and women like the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. And I want to tell us that the God of the mission has a church in the world. He is expecting that church, which is you and myself, to go to work and evangelize. It will be such a joy when we get to heaven and see somebody who was struggling in sin and you witnessed to them and they have made it to heaven. It will be such a joy. It will be such a joy when you see your son, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your parents that you witnessed to making it to heaven. Let's stand up on our feet. Hallelujah. You have to be involved in the Great Commission if you are a believer. When Mark was talking, he said, and all these signs shall follow them that believe. It doesn't talk about, uh, uh, Mark does not talk about pastors and evangelists and all that. He's talking about believers. The signs must follow them that believe. So I want us to go before the Lord and ask him to help us. As we serve in the Great Commission, are you a believer? Then you have some work to do. If you have been thinking that um, the Great Commission is for some people, it is for you and those other people. Let us sign up before the Lord and tell him, here I am. I am ready, Lord, that you may use me. I am ready that, Lord, you may use my resources. I'm ready that, Lord, you can count on me. When it comes to presence, my presence, my resources, and every effort so that the people can be reached with the gospel. I just want you to go before the Lord and just say a prayer in a few seconds before we continue. Father, help us as a church. You have given us the great commission. And Father, here we are, oh God, maybe we've never understood it in the past, but now, Lord, you're making it clearer by day, oh God. The much that we understand today, Jehovah, we want to sign up that you may use us, oh God, even to the ends of the earth, even, my Father, to every ethnic group, oh Jehovah, we pray that none is going to miss heaven because we never witness to them. Father, we have unreached people groups in our places of work, in the states where we live, in the places we go, my Father. Lord, I pray that you help us, oh God, not to be quiet, but to reach out unto many and bring many to the kingdom of our God. So, Father, help us this morning.